Kayla, do you have anybody that um, you're trying to get in or we're good to go? I think we're good for right now. If anybody else pops in, we'll let them in as they come in. Okay, awesome. All right. Welcome, everybody. Glad that you're here and glad that you. Well, I can um, hear you. Okay, we can hear you, Kent. We can hear you. <laughs> so um, we're, I'm glad that you're all here carving out this time for the School Mental Health Advisory uh -huh. Council. I can't find it. And um, a couple of quick announcements. I will start the meeting, oh, yeah. of course, yeah. Kayla, and then we'll have Kayla do some roll call. And before she does that, you're probably wondering why I'm even speaking, <laughs> why I'm here. My name is Jane Groff, and I'm the executive director of the Kansas Parent Information Resource Center, a TASN, a KSBE TASN project. And I have been vice chair of this council for since the beginning, which I think is six or seven years, I believe. Worked alongside Kathy Bush, who was the chair. And Kathy, as you may have heard, has recently went into true retirement. She was retired and then graciously was our state board representative on this council for the six or seven years. And wow, she did such a good job. But she did officially retire. She did. And so as vice chair today, I am um, stepping up and filling in for um, uh, a chair today. And then also one other major note to the group is that Shanna, who from KSDE, who was a major um, contributor and organizer for the School Mental Health Advisory Council, just recently received a new position um, to work with, you know, her love is, has been always early childhood to work in this world of um, early childhood, I think Head Start in particular. Yes, so Shanna will, uh, I guess the, I think the 24th is her first day, be oh. the uh, Director of Early Childhood Outcomes for the uh, Community Action on Poverty Head Start Program here in Shawnee County. Great. So we will miss her, miss her a lot and all she did on this council and in the area of school mental health but we're wishing her the very best fit in the new position. So um, I think anybody else has a comment or anything to change or add before Kayla does roll call? Jane, I have something I would like to add. Okay. I would like to add that Gail Tripp will now be um, taking over as assistant for KSDE's role call of school mental health, and she'll be replacing me going forward. I'll still be here helping out as she's still getting her footing for this, but she will be taking over after this for this meeting. Welcome, Gail. So, so Gail should say hi to everybody so we all can see her. That's right. Gail, where are you? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Gail. <laughs> so glad to have you, and thank you for joining the council. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And I believe that our new board representative, uh, the state board of, uh, representative, is Betty Arnold. And I do not believe she is on yet because she said she had a scheduling conflict till maybe 9.30ish or so. So anyway, we welcome Betty Arnold as the state board representative and are excited to get to know her and have her as part of this group. So you'll see her pop on. All right, Kayla, so all those changes, all those changes. Kayla, you want to do roll call? Yep, we'll go ahead and get started. As you hear your name, please unmute and let me know that you're here. Jean Clifford. Jane Groff. Here. Samantha Brown. Shelby Bruckerhoff. 
Tracy Chauvin. Uh, this is Shelby. I'm here. Sorry, I couldn't get my mouse to work. <laughs> Tracy's here. Jose Cornelius. Present. Misty Zar Zarnowski. Sorry. I'm here. Sherry Domelin. I'm here. Diane Jirstead. Chili, good morning. Cherie Blanchett. Present. Marsha Wiesman. Gary Hinault. Jessica Lane. Hi, I'm here and I'm new to the committee as well. Welcome. Lori Marshall. Leah Holly. Good morning, all. Tamara Huff. Good morning. Ken Huey, I believe, has left. And Jessica, were you his replacement? Yes, I am. Okay. Kimber Katsitz. Good morning. Mallory Keefe. Kathy K.O. Monica Kurz. Lori Marshall. This is Sue Mernan with the Association of Community Mental Health Centers. And Lori is no longer with the association. She's transferred over to a different role. And so I'll be the replacement for the association. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Scott Engelmeyer. Dr. John McKinney. Present. Kathy Mosier. Monica Mernan. Hello. Dina Novak, John Epley, John Dahl, Kimberly O'Connor, here, Judy Rodman, good morning, Melanie Scott, good morning, Shirley Scott, Idalia Schumann. Good morning. Rochelle Sodden. Present. Dinah Sykes. Mark Tokelson. Kelsey Torres. Ryan Vaughn. Good morning. Casey Dalk. Paige White. Julian Walker. Pam Wigan. Holly Yeager. Janie Humphreys. Present. And Jamie Dover. Present. As for KSDE staff, Bert Moore. Present. Barb DePew. I'm here. Kent Reed. Good morning. Carrie Haig. Good morning. John Calvert. Angie Brungart, Gail Tripp. Here. How about Trish Backman? And Trish Backman. 
I'm here. <laughs> and Maureen. I'm here <clears throat> too. Thank you, Maureen. Yep. All right. Is that everybody, Kayla? Hey, I'm Erica Mould. I'm here for Monica Kurz um, to represent KSPHQ. I wasn't sure if Monica would be here today, um, but I will be taking over her role um, when she, while she's on maternity leave. Welcome, Erica. Thank you. And Erica, what organization are you with? Kansas Suicide Prevention Headquarters. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. And welcome Sue and Jessica, who also mentioned they were um, covering for other folks in their organization. Thank you for telling us that. It really helps us keep our, our roles and attendance cleaned up because a group this size, it is really hard. Um, so we appreciate when you say that you're here for somebody and how long you're doing it, that sort of thing. Thanks so much. So anybody else that needs to identify themselves or wants to, we've got you. Okay, so let's move to the approval of the agenda. So the agenda was sent out a couple of times. And so I'm sure you either have it in front of you or you're looking at it. So we need a, a, a motion and an approval, I think. This is John. I uh, move the approval of the agenda. Oh, okay, yeah. Thanks, John. And Shelby, I heard Shelby, you are unmuted. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Thank you, John. Thanks for moving. Do we have a second? Jose Cornejo, I second. Thanks, Jose. All right, so let's move to the minutes. And they sent those out a couple of times. Jane, can we yeah. vote on the agenda? Oh, thank you. You need to um, you need to teach this rookie chair. What, what <laughs> I think there's a poll. I'm not sure Kayla usually has a oh. poll. Kayla, do you have a poll? I have it. And I have it up. Can everybody see it? No. No, we cannot. <laughs> okay. Let me. There it is. We see it. Okay. Thank you, Bert. I was moving along there. Great. Thanks for the poll, Gail. You're welcome. All right, so let's do the same thing for the minutes if they are um, to be approved. Will somebody um, move on the minutes? I move that we accept <laughs> the minutes. This is Tamara Huff. Thanks, Tammy. This is John, I second. Thank you, John. And now we get to vote. Okay. I like polls. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> They're kind of fun. Okay. All right. So now on your agenda, you see that public comment um, are next. And generally, we don't always have something in this area. But today, we've had two requests. So is Beth Patton on yet? Do we know, Kayla? Is Beth with us? Yes, I'm here. All right, Beth, you can unmute. And I think we had you planned in for about five minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Beth Patton and I live in Southeast Kansas. Um, I um, had adopted three grandchildren um, that took about four years and I got that done last year. <clears throat> and I have, all of them have, you know, obvious trauma and mental health diagnoses. Um, and I, I guess I was scrolling through trying to find some information. Um, it took, and that's how I came upon this council. It took 13 months, uh, special ed eval, three denied 504 eligibilities. Um, anyway, and for finally to get a 504 on mental health issues in the school. 
Um, we had that two weeks ago. And I think the, the, the reason I wanted to speak is I'm, I'm a, I am a former educator, a uh, 14 year special ed, still, still licensed, uh, don't practice. Uh, I'm a mental health clinician. I'm getting um, ABA certified um, to work with autism. I am appalled. I, I thought DCF was, I'm sorry. I, I thought my trek on getting the adoption was, was the issue. Um, and I thought everything would be great here from out, here on out. Um, I have two kids in high school. Both of them truthfully need so <laughs> accommodations. Um, finally got the 504 a couple of weeks ago. And what I want the council to understand um, from a parent perspective is depending on where you live and where I live, um, mental health is not seen as a disability. Now, federally, I understand that it is. Um, but one of the things I think is important is they have the education. I was, I, I had in services on it. Um, it's the buy-in from the, I think I heard something um, on, I did watch the minutes from last December. I think I heard some people say, we gotta be careful about how I say this. Um, it, I guess I don't have to, cause I'm not on the camp. So, but it's legislative. I've been told, I think John Calvert knows me because I talked about MHA. I think I emailed him on MHIT. Gary Hanal knows me from, I think my work with, or emails with Andy. Um, it's the, it, I've been told that the schools cannot be forced to do what the, the statutes require. Um, so what I ended up doing as a parent is um, I disenrolled my child for two hours of the day and opened a homeschool so that he can have dual enrollment um, because we couldn't get a shortened day. Um, his mental health has impacted. Um, when you have children, two children that, you know, I, I heard about the suicide um, line and all these things. Those are awesome. But when you can't get support in the schools to recognize that mental health up here does affect education on a daily basis, those, those things are not as effective as they need to be. Um, just yesterday, and I wasn't, as a grandparent, I'm starting, a, I think um, I told Miss um, Love that I'm starting an advocacy group. Jane Adams, a very good, great friend of mine from Keys for Networking is gonna be on the board of directors. Um, it is called GRASP, Grandparents Reaching for Assistance as Secondary Parents. Um, Leah, Holla, no, Leah Holly, I've talked to her. Um, I'm going to reach out to grandparents because like I said, all of all the education and the roles that I've had in the past 20 years of working, this has been a nightmare. It has been a nightmare to get the services that my kids need. And they're not, well, they're my kids now. And, and I would do it all over again. Um, but I know that I'm stronger than a lot of people are because I can find what's needed. There are people that don't, I mean, I'm 55, okay. Um, there are people in their 60s that have their grandkids, 70s. Uh, I cannot imagine what I have gone through without knowing what I know. Because I, I really don't know that people would, they, they just lay down. And I obviously don't, which is probably part of my problem. Uh, but it's also got me, the, the kids, what they need. Um, so I have the one that he's duly enrolled. That was a you know, through HB 2567, <clears throat> that was a stretch. Um, I finally got that, but he's still getting, you know, we have MHIT, great. So I asked John Keller, <laughs> um, what, what is that? Like, how can I access that? Well, our MHIT liaison is the attendance gatekeeper. And so the only thing she will do is she tells me when my child has detentions because he has been too tardy although now it's on a 504, that it can't be penalized for first hour. But that's her role. And to me as a clinician, 
well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get paid to do that. I would not do that. Um, my role as a social worker would not be to do attendance. But again, that's what our MHIT, our district has decided to do with her. Um, these are the things I think that it's, it's, none of it is, I heard, what did I hear at the thing I heard? Um, Jane Groff talked about absenteeism. Um, there are reasons why kids are not there. It's not they don't want to go to school. There are barriers. Um, Shanna Bigler, I said, I think talked about um, family issues, connectedness. Uh, we have TBRI, which is one of those new therapies connecting. But I am not connected to the school because I am the advocate or the other letter <laughs> starting with a B. That, that's what they think of me. Um, I want to be a partner. Beth? Yes, yeah, this, is, this is Jane. And uh -huh. so um, can you in about 30 seconds or so, uh -huh. um, um, you've done a great job summarizing, it's rough, but can you in 30 seconds or so just state what you'd like um, to see different? What would be your desire? I, what I, it's not going to happen, but I, the schools need to be from the top down. I have two sisters that are teachers. They're great but they have so many responsibilities. They can't do a lot of stuff, but they also can't because some, I, the administration has to be the ones that are the leaders. They have to be the ones that say, we do this and we're going to do it because it's right or we're going to do it because it's a law. I don't care which it is, <laughs> but that's, that's where I think that it has to come from. I don't think it will, which is why I'm starting the parent group and we're going to get done what we can write our own plans if we need to. Um, because I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. So, all right, thank you, Beth. Thank, thank you. you. So, and I want to tell you something that about ten to twelve years ago, there was a grandparent group in the Department of Aging. I worked with them. I talked with them and presented with them often. And um, so I am thrilled you're starting that group. And you might check with the Department of Aging. Let them know what you're doing and see what guidance and or expansion they can help you with. Okay. Because it's a great idea. It is a need. And so I would encourage you to um, try to reach out to them and see if that can um, be either reestablished or grown. Okay. And, and it, does anybody else have a question for Beth? We appreciate well, um, under, under public comment, Jane, we really don't oh. engage, but okay. I do want Beth to understand that we do have a complaint procedure here at KSDE. If you requested a special education evaluation and you were denied that evaluation through a prior written notice, then you have the right to ask for additional support. I would ask that you contact Mark Ward, who is my attorney here at the SETS team, and describe the issues you've been encountering and see what support he can provide for you and your family. And it's mward at ksde.org. Okay, all right, thank you. He'll take the time to listen to all of your issues and let you know under the law what, you, what the rights you have and how you can address those rights with this agency that okay. seems not to be listening to you. Okay, all right, thank you, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, in the interest of time and moving on to the next comment, Beth, Leah also reached out in the chat and said you can contact her and the families together would be willing to work with you to provide assistance. Okay, all right, thanks. Thanks, Trish. Thanks, Bert. Um, I appreciate your guidance and guidance for Beth um, for next steps. Um, we're glad that you're advocates for your grandchildren, Beth. Beautiful. Okay, um, our next um, uh, public comment today is Melanie Scott, and is Melanie on? And I am. All Good right. Morning. Okay, thanks, Mel. No problem. I've, um, this is my second year of being a member of this advisory council, so I just really appreciate the opportunity to um, share some concerns and then see where we can take it from here. Um, I'm a school counselor in Dodge City, Kansas. I have been a school counselor since 2003, so almost 20 years. Um, I'm the department head, and I also have a full caseload here at the high school. 
Uh, I'm working on my doctoral program through K-State in counselor supervision and education. And so just real quick, I just wanna share my why, why I'm so passionate about suicide prevention and this toolkit. Um, as a district, we experienced our first student suicide in 2014. And like many school districts at that time, we didn't have a suicide crisis uh, plan in, in our crisis plan. There was information for what to do in a fire drill, tornado drill, all the other things, but nothing about uh, what to do when a student dies by suicide or even any student death, honestly. So our district counselors worked really hard to find best practices. Um, we connected with other states and um, you know, looked at the ASCA recommendations, the NASP, you know, the school psychologist and some of the other best practices and put something together for our district. And so this happened honestly before the state toolkit came out. Um, I also am a uh, leader coordinator for KSDE. So throughout the school year and in the summer, I get to provide professional development for school counselors. So this is a, that's a part time job. So I, I have I wear a lot of a lot of hats, if you, as you notice. Um, but with the recent HB two five six seven, there's a big chunk of it in section twenty seven that is about what to do when a student comes to you with suicidal ideation. And what I noticed in this toolkit that we um, have on KSDE is that it doesn't have an amendment. It doesn't have an update on that. So as I was going through that, I also noticed that um, as part of the screener, it asked us to assign risk levels. And again, when I say this, I'm speaking from a school counselor lens. Um, I cannot speak as a school social worker. I cannot speak as a school psychologist. I'm hoping after this that we can form a committee to all work together to do best practices for school mental health. But um, according to the ASCA ethics, school counselors are not to assign risk levels. So what I mean by that is when a student comes to us with suicide ideation or it's passed on by a teacher or concerned peer, we visit with that student and we absolutely get a hold of the parents and we proceed from there. Um, according to what's on the uh, toolkit, it's saying at the very end of the screener, they're asking us to assign a risk level, either low, immediate risk or extreme risk. And again, um, school counselors should not be assigning a risk level. We should just be saying, parents, there is a risk and you need to take action. So what I have provided, and I know Kayla sent that out, and I'm also going to put, put it in the chat here because I updated it just a little bit, is a document uh, with some considerations for updating our Kansas uh, Suicide Prevention Response and Postvention Toolkit. And the biggest thing is if we could not assign risk levels in the toolkit. Um, because here's our question. Even if it's not a school counselor, maybe it's a school psych or a school social worker that's evaluating that student, does the school district want to be liable for any school mental health professional making that determination of a risk factor? Is it better to share with the parents, hey, there is a risk present and we recommend that you take action and here's how you can do it. Here are the resources, let us help you through this. So I have uh, shared some resources, I shared some recommendations, I kind of went through the toolkit. You know, something else I noticed is it hasn't updated the 988 number and there's a few other things as well. So I'm really recommending that we put together um, a, a yearly committee, at least, to evaluate, hey, here's where, where we are with the toolkit. Is there any new legislation that we need to make sure that we have updated the toolkit so that our school mental health across Kansas knows how to use this toolkit and make sure it's in compliance with best practices? And um, provide ongoing training. You know, as part of my job with KSDE now, I can provide that training throughout the school year and in the summer so that school mental health across the state of Kansas knows how to use this toolkit. And not only school mental health, it's just as important for some training to happen with our administration and our district people as well, because school counselors and school social workers can know all the things, but if that isn't passed on to the people above us that are making some of the decisions, um, then that's not gonna help either. So just know that I know I'm willing, I know that some of you guys are willing as well to maybe get together and provide some professional development. So that's all I have for today. Um, I know that I'm just now a part of the public minutes, but if you guys have any questions, you guys are more than welcome to get a hold of me. I don't know if it's permissible, but can I add to what Melanie shared from, from my lens as a counselor educator? During public comment, we're supposed to be listening to the individual and we as a team do not comment, but we can bring it up when we get back to 
uh, updates or reports from members, then you could bring it up there during the 1145 time, Jessica. Perfect. So just make Thank a you. note and you can bring it up at that point in time. I Thank also, you for the guidance. <clears throat> I would also like to do that as well. Jane, the only thing I'll say is Melanie has some great points that she's pointed out and the department will take that under consideration. I just not, asked that we, as yeah, we we're not disagreeing this. with you, Melanie. Right. I think you brought up some great points that we need to, as a department, uh, review. Okay, this Involve is just a you. very time sensitive matter. Um, we're talking about saving lives here and there have been court cases against school mental health for making those assessed risks. So. Yeah, I'll just bring it up again when it comes to 1145. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, for your careful, careful um, look at the kit. Thank you. Gosh, we need that. All right. Um, wonderful public comments. Let's move on to um, the 930 Crystal. I think Del Masco, are you on Crystal? I am on. And am I saying this, I, I can read the Narcan, but am I saying naloxone right? You said it perfectly. Woohoo, okay. All right, Crystal, you inform us. All right, and do I have the ability to share? Do you see share screen mm -hmm. on, at the bottom? Yes. You, you yes. should Gail, be able to share. Gail will select you so you can share, Crystal. So you I, should be able to share now. I can if, um whoever is sharing gail would you mind stop sharing and then i can share there we go perfect thank you hey thanks for having me this morning um and we'll talk uh about naloxone you said it just perfectly let me move everything back over because it's zoom and everything moves as soon as you start to share. So my name is Crystal Dalmaso. I am with DECA's Prevention Services. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about naloxone, Narcan, and we'll talk about um, the difference there um, here in just a bit. So thanks for having me through. It's going to be a very quick run through this morning. We have uh, trainings uh, that we provide at DECA that generally take an hour. So I'm gonna encourage you that if you want more information after I get done this morning, you can take the general audience training. You can also go through our self-paced uh, learning module that we have on our website. This is gonna be a very quick run through, um, but I will do my best to get a lot of information your way in the next 30 minutes. Um, really my goal today is just to provide you with an understanding of the urgency about this topic, how to recognize an overdose, how to respond, and then how to administer naloxone um, when you suspect that there is an opiate uh, overdose. So we'll get right into it. Um, many of you I know are familiar with DECA, but if you're not familiar with DECA, we are a nonprofit agency here in Kansas. Um, that we provide human services and we have our goal is to enrich the life um, of those in our communities, those adults, those youth and children that live within our communities. We have residential and outpatient uh, behavioral health care. We have our fo foster and adoption services, our family preservation services. Um, we have our traffic safety, um, which is umbrellaed under our community-based services, as well as our substance misuse prevention, which is where I sit. And we've been around for over 40 years. We're in Kansas and Oklahoma. So just to give you a little peek at DECA spokes to our wheels, if you weren't familiar. So let's jump right on in. Um, <clears throat> drug overdose is actually now the leading cause of injury death in the U.S. since 2019. Before then, it was car crashes. So this means that there are more people that are likely to die from a drug overdose than in a car crash on the road now. So we're going to take a little bit of a, a data look for those of you that really like to hop into the data. Um, the history of opioid overdose deaths in the late 1990s, we see the first wave, if you see the teal line on your screen, that's when the pharmaceutical companies reassured the medical community that patients would not become addicted to opioids. There was a white paper release saying that opioids were not addictive. 
Um, and then it, a movement began in the medical community to monitor pain as that fifth vital sign. Many of you may remember. You might remember going to the doctor's office and seeing that pain scale with the smiley faces. And so you had to rate your pain. And pharmace pharmaceutical companies uh, push the use of that scale as part of their marketing of opioids to reduce pain. Um, I know depending what doctor's office you go to, you might even see the, the pain scale, scale still used. The focus on opioids as a pain relief had significant impacts nationally, and that's led to overdose deaths from prescription medications. If you look at the Navy line on the graph, that's the second wave of the epidemic, and that began in 2010. And this line is made up of overdose deaths due to heroin. You can see on the graph that prescription opioids decreased around the time that heroin's increased. And this is due to uh, prescribing guidelines for opioids. Um, they began being introduced and this led to doctors abruptly stopping the opioid prescriptions. Um, and so without prescriptions, some patients who had developed that addiction then turned to heroin. If you look at the purple line, um, that's our, our third wave. Um, and we can see another large rise there. This trend started because of illicit synthetic opioid manufacturing like fentanyl. Um, and we've seen a huge increase in fentanyl deaths because of its high potency, um, especially in comparison with uh, drugs like heroin. This causes people to overdose very quickly and we're continuing to see the line increase over time. So we saw the waves of opioids throughout history, um, but it's important, important for us to keep in mind that with all drug use, there might actually be some stigma attached. And the concern with that stigma is it can create um, barriers to recovery. So barriers we think about, we think of cost, we think fear, um, there are cultural barriers, maybe some transportation, uh, job responsibilities or family responsibilities, but stigma can also be a barrier um, for recovery. Like many uh, other chronic illnesses, people with a substance use disorder can have reoccurrence or relapse on their journey to recovery. Uh, so the reason we want to just kind of pause and take a look at this uh, is that when somebody relapses with diabetes or high blood pressure, we generally don't place judgment or treat them negatively. However, drug relapse is often treated differently. So we want to offer both compassion and information about preventing overdose. So a common question that comes to mind, how do I know if it's an opioid? because opioids come under so many different names. The best way to know if you're taking an opioid is to ask your doctor or your pharmacist, uh, because in this training, in this uh, few minutes that, that we're here together today, we're not saying that opioids are bad or without medical use. Really what my goal here is just to give you information about these medications so that way you can make an informed decision because even when you're prescribed um, medication for legitimate health needs, opioids fall into that class of very powerful medications, um, and they do come with a risk of overdose. So all of the substances here that you see on your screen would be illicit if they were not prescribed to you, but fentanyl and heroin are commonly illicit manufactured opioids. And fentanyl is a medication that can be prescribed as well as illicitly manufactured. So fentanyl has gained attention because of its high potency and connection to increasing overdose deaths. Uh, most of the deaths are from the illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Data from the DEA tells us that six in 10 illicitly manufactured pills contains a deadly dose of fentanyl. And that was just increased. We did have the data that said four in 10, and now we know that it's six in 10 um, illicitly manufactured pills. So if you're taking a pill that's not been prescribed by your doctor or filled at a pharmacy, could you even tell the difference between that real pill or that illicitly manufactured pill? It's going to be really hard to tell what medications are prescribed versus which ones are not. Uh, and that pill that, that you're getting that may not be prescribed by the doctor or filled by the pharmacist, it really could be fake. That message is an 
so important to share with our youth um, because they trust people. And so medications are not for sharing, even from those trusted friends, trusted loved ones. We want to make sure that they're only taking um, prescriptions that are prescribed to them and filled by a doctor or pharmacist. It's so important to get uh, our medications from a licensed doctor or pharmacy because this is what a deadly dose of fentanyl looks like. It's so small, it fits on the tip of your pen or pencil. And I meant, here's my pen here. If you just look down, gla glance at your pen, because I know this is on your screen, and think about the tip of your pen or your pencil and how small that is. And that would be a deadly dose of fentanyl. So non-prescription pills don't come with an ingredients list. So we have no idea if there is a deadly dose of fentanyl inside those pills. That's why it's so important to get this message to our young people. So how opioids affect us? They actually affect individuals in their breathing. So in the picture on the slide, the Ys represent the opioid receptors in the brain. When an opioid is taken, it attaches to these receptors. They fit very well together, so well that that's what gives us the pain relief. Um, it also gives us feelings of euphoria. Um, the, the feelings can vary from person to person, but often people experience feeling very relaxed and calm, um, and so they, they are de-stressed. That person taking an opioid really can have such a positive experience that they want to take it again and again and again. And this can lead to the misuse of opioids with higher dosages happening more and more frequently. So an opioid overdose emergency occurs when there are so many opioid molecules in the brain that they overwhelm the receptors that are there and block the body's drive to breathe. So as soon as five to 10 minutes after taking the opioid is when that individual might see the effects. So they may see, um, they may see uh, effects like a weak pulse or shallow breathing, low blood pressure, and depending on how the opioid was taken, because it can be taken by mouth, a skin patch or an injection, um, the effects can actually peak within 30 minutes to an hour. So as people take opioids over time, their tolerance level um, increases and they need more and more to feel the effects, which is what puts them at a significant risk for that overdose. Especially when people are coming off of long periods of abstinence. So if they've been in jail or incarceration, or maybe they've been in treatment, they have a reoccurrence or relapse, they go back to the dosage that they were taking before they went into incarceration or, or treatment, they take that large dosage and that can lead to an overdose. Since opioid overdose occurs while the body is shutting down, um, we see a lot of the symptoms that are on your screen. So that person may not be, um, be able to be woken up because they're not breathing. They may not be breathing because the opioids have overloaded the brain receptors and the body's shutting down. They may be snoring or gurgling because they're struggling to breathe or maybe they've thrown up. Um, that person may have blue or gray lips and their fingernails because they're not getting enough oxygen through their body. They may have really tiny pupils. And this is um, because the opioid the opioid use that that individual has done, um, the pupils may no longer change in response to the light because of how the opioid affects the central nervous system. Um, and if you feel their skin, it may feel cold or clammy because the blood, again, it's not circulating to regulate the body temperature. So naloxone, that's what we're talking about today. Naloxone is an opioid overdose reversal medication. It's the same thing as Narcan or Coloxado. Those are the brand names. So just like we say Band-Aid, that's the brand name. Um, Narcan and Coloxado, those are the brand names. Um, so I refer to it as Naloxone because that's the medication name. Um, <clears throat> naloxone does not hurt anybody who's taking it. So if they don't take an opioid and they're given Naloxone, it's not gonna have an effect on them. It's safe. For children, it's safe for dogs um, because dogs have gotten into opioids as well. So the dosage is the same for everyone and it's a safe medication. 
It actually works within one to three minutes and it can last 30 minutes to 90 minutes. Uh, the typical shelf life for naloxone is two years. So you can get a replacement kit if you need to, but if you only have access to an, un, um, an expired kit, use it because using that expired kit is still way more effective than not intervening um, when somebody is overdosing. Like with all medications, you want to properly store naloxone. So if you have naloxone, properly store it. You want to keep it away from extreme heat or freezing temperatures because that can make the, um, the medication less effective. So let's see how it works on the body. <clears throat> so you can see in this slide that naloxone would affect the receptors when you're breathing it into your nose. So I have my little naloxone. There's no naloxone medication in this one. But if I were to breathe it into my nose, then it's going to affect the receptors. Naloxone actually knocks the opioids off the receptors, allowing that individual to breathe, and it removes the high off of the opioids. So this means the individual may go into immediate opioid withdrawal when waking up. They might feel sick. They may be in pain. Be careful because they may be confused and their legs may be swinging or their arms may be swinging. We'll talk about that here in a second. So if they're not breathing, you're like, oh, you put it in, they're going to breathe it in. The medication is still absorbed because it's actually absorbed in the mucous membranes. So it's still going to have an effect. You still want to give it even if they're not breathing. So six easy steps you can take. Um, you've got naloxone, you suspect somebody has overdosed on opioids. Here are the six easy steps that you take um, when you sus suspect this emergency. And we'll look at each one of these. First, you found somebody, you suspect there's a medical emergency. You wanna see if you can get a response um, to gauge the seriousness of their distress. So if they're unresponsive, when you initially try to wake them up, you can do um, that sternal rub. So you make your fist, put up your middle finger. You can do this on yourself while I'm talking. Um, and then rub the middle of your sternum. If you're doing that on yourself, you're like, how, Crystal, that's not what I wanted to do this morning. It's a little painful, right? So just doing it even lightly, that's, that's painful. If they were just sleeping, you're going to be able to get a response out of them and wake them up. If they don't respond after you do um, the sternal rub, or maybe they respond and their voice is very slurred, uh, their speech is slow, call 911 for support immediately because there's a medical emergency here. We wanna get EMS on their way. Um, we've gotta get that medical help as soon as possible. We may need to get them transferred to that medical facility. So you suspect, the person is in an overdose, you've called 911 because you can't get them aroused or they're, um, they're very slurred in their speech. Um, EMS is on their way. It's time to administer the naloxone. And giving naloxone is really easy. It's just as easy as using nasal spray that you might have used before for allergies. So just remember three Ps, peel, place, and press. You take it out of your kit, um, I've taken mine out of my kit. I've peeled it off. Um, I place it in my nose and I press the bottom button there to administer the medication. Same thing um, if you were um, using uh, allergy medication, you would do the same thing. So similar here. So if that person reacts immediately and starts breathing again, that's positive, but we also want to keep EMS on their way. Naloxone, it can wear off. So depending on the amount of opioids that that individual has in their system, we want to continue uh, to have medical help on the way. So once the individual responds to the naloxone, I said earlier, they might go into immediate withdrawal. So they might feel sick. They might be in pain. They also might try to stand up because they're reacting out of um, confusion. So make sure that you're near the upper part of their body and steer clear of their legs because we don't know if their legs are going to try and kick. Speak calmly to them, help reassure them that help is on the way, that you've given them naloxone, but EMS um, is coming. If they don't react after the first dose, so you've you've tried the sternum rub, you know you need to give naloxone, you've given a lot, you've called 911, you've given the naloxone. Um, you want to start CPR. 
this isn't a CPR class today. Definitely take CPR if you haven't. But um, we want to start CPR, especially when the person isn't breathing, because we want to help keep that oxy oxygen circulating and because it helps circulate the naloxone that you just get, um, had administered to them. So start the CPR <clears throat> um, to get that oxygen and naloxone circulating. Only give the rescue breaths if you feel like you can protect yourself in that situation, but definitely start the chest compression so that you can get the oxygen and naloxone circulating. So depending on how many opioids are in the body, that person may require another dose of naloxone. In the kits that, that DECA sends out, there are two doses. Um, so there are two, um, two times you can give naloxone and you can give that second dose. If you need to give the second dose, remember, continue the CPR after the second dose and continue to keep EMS there as well. If they respond um, and their breathing is restored, we wanna make sure we get them into that recovery position. We're gonna stay with them until EMS arrives. Um, you can see here on the screen, you wanna move them into that recovery uh, position by placing the, their hand under their chin, keeping that airway open, because again, they may have uh, vomited or they may have um, spit saliva in their mouth. That opposite leg is bent because we don't want them to roll over onto their side. Um, and that arm is also going to help prevent them from rolling over. <clears throat> One thing to note about um, getting them into the recovery position, you can do it on either side unless that person is pregnant. We wanna make sure we get them on the left side of their body. The main thing here is to allow their airway to be clear um, so they're not choking on their own spit or vomit. So just to recap, uh, we wanna try and stimulate them. We wanna make sure EMS is alerted immediately to get them on their way. Those are precious minutes. Uh, we wanna administer the naloxone and start CPR. If we need to, we'll repeat that. We'll administer the naloxone again and continue to do CPR and then get them into that recovery position if they begin to breathe again. In Kansas, there are certain legal protections for administering naloxone. You can see here on your screen. Um, this slide here is showing the Kansas legislation and regulations. Um, and so it does allow for any patient, bystander, first responding agency, a school nurse to be able to possess and administer naloxone. So in Kansas, if naloxone is administered in good faith, the person should not be um, subjected to li uh, civil liability or criminal uh, prosecution. So just to keep in mind there. There are so many things that we can do as individuals to help prevent overdoses uh, within our communities. Yes, we want to make sure we have an naloxone kit in our home, especially if we have opioids, uh, but we also want to make sure that we are safely storing and disposing of medications so that they're, they don't get into the wrong hands as well. So never take any medications, like I mentioned, that are not prescribed to us. And we also want to be making sure that we are getting that message across to our youth that they are not taking medication that are not prescribed to them. If um, we have medication and it is out, then it's uh, available for anybody to be able to take uh, when they walk by. So we want to make sure that we are securely um, uh, securing our medication uh, when we have it in the home. So proper, um, proper medication um, storage. And you can do that with a medication lockbox. You can do that with a medication lock bag. You can also put it up in a cabinet, um, but never in like out on a on a night night side table. Uh, not just can, not only can youth get to that medication, but animals can get to that medication as well. So we want to make sure it's up, out of the reach of children, locked away, so anybody just can't get to it. If you have expired medication or maybe medication that you've stopped using, again, we don't want it out and available. We want to make sure we're safely disposing of that medication. So you can use um, medication deactivation bags. You can get them from DECA. Um, or you can also, we don't want to flush them down the toilet, but we want to get them broken down before we put them into um, our garbage. So there are ways that we can help you do that as well. So you can reach out to us and, and we can share with you some options. 
There's access to treatment and resources in Kansas. 211 is a great resource for that. You can call 24-7. Um, we also have 988, which is a great resource for um, uh, mental health challenges and crisis. So if you know somebody who is in distress, um, that is another uh, resource line that we can reach out to. And I think I kept my time just within the time limits. If I saw that there were some um, questions in the chat, and I am happy to, um, oh, let me stop sharing. My apologies. Stop share. I'm happy to answer any questions about naloxone. We have several people that are um, educated and are over our naloxone pro program at DECA, and we'd be more than happy to um, to touch base with you or bring our full one hour um, a training to a specific community or group if, if that is of interest. That was awesome, Crystal. I learned a ton and um, I can't imagine, you know, an hour presentation would be, you know, terrific. And because um, I learned so much in that amount of time. Anybody have any thoughts or questions for Crystal? I do, Jane. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can yeah. hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm interested in data as it has to do with um, high school students. I did not know if that was... Um, Aggregate, aggregate data that you presented on the opioid overdose, but specifically, if it's a problem with students over the state of Kansas, are there, is there data available on that? And um, because I'm wondering in terms of awareness, how much we have presented this as a problem for Kansas high school students. Yeah, that's a great question. There is data. Um, the KCTC survey is a great one to get um, that information from the youth perspective on um, opioid use. Um, and I can, I was trying to get to it really quickly. I did not have that ready to offer, but I'm more than happy to send out that information for the state of Kansas or for a specific um, uh, county um, or at least show you where the link is. So if we have the data for that, that county, if your school participates in the KCTC survey, um, I would definitely encourage you to look at that data specifically. While alcohol tends to be the number one substance that is still um, the substance that we need to focus on because youth are still using alcohol at a higher rate, uh, opioids are definitely something that we need to look at because they are it, it's being used and not only is it being used, it, the fentanyl crisis is so deadly so quickly, especially when they're using pills they think are from trusted people and they don't know what's inside of them and they don't know if that fentanyl has a deadly or that pill has a deadly dose of fentanyl. Um, and they're taking it in good faith, thinking they're going to be okay. And then that's when an overdose occurs. But I'd be more than happy to send out um, Kansas, uh, Kansas youth statistics. I think we'd all love to see that crystal and to know that. So um, good question, Betty, and welcome, Betty. We talked about you earlier as our new board uh, representative. So glad you could join us. Mm. Yeah, Crystal. So if you want to send that, if it's, you know, to Kayla, Kayla can get it out to the entire group or you can put it in the chat or something like that, or you can do both. Sure, I will send it to Kayla and that way you've got a couple of different ways to look at it. Yeah, so very, very informative and very sobering, very sobering. Any I other? Have, I have one question. Crystal, are you doing any training in schools? So we, we've done a lot of training here lately with specifically with law enforcement. We will come to schools. Um, I know there would spend uh, a don't quote me on what schools we have gone to, but I know our community support specialists around the state of Kansas um, have educated school administration in some areas. 
Um, but we've not made a target of the, we need to target this school or this school or this school. We are happy to, and it's important. I think we need to. That presentation you just did, Crystal, would be a great thing to link and send out to all superintendents so that they can make a choice if it's something they want to work with their school board to adopt and have present, especially if they have evidence of any opioid use within their student population, because just one student that you could have saved is one student of knowledge that I wish I would have had. Right. So, you know, we have EpiPens and we allow kids to carry EpiPens. We're not going to have them carrying naloxone, but at the same time, we might. It depends. I mean, we know kids are using and we know that the, we know staff are using. So it's an issue of having the availability in case we have an emergency and then wondering, we call 911, well, a person can die within five minutes. Right. So Kimber uh, put in the chat about the work that they've done in Wichita in regards to this. Kimber, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Um, and honestly, DECA has been such a huge help to us. I attended a couple of conferences in the fall, the Opioid and Stimulant Conference in November, and then the uh, Prevention Conference, I think, was in October. And so... Um, we have implemented naloxone in all of our buildings, um, even elementary schools. And so we have trained our nurses and health room assistants. They're working on training um, security guards and SROs at the secondary level. And then um, other like possibly members of child study team, admin in the building, um, trying to get this rolled out. And I would say the hardest part, um, I love her slides and I, I've, I've taken a lot from uh, DECA to try to uh, simplify things for people that are lay people for understanding. Um, I think the big piece, a lot of people are scared, just like with EpiPens when we train people for severe anaphylaxis. Um, you're not going to hurt someone, but guess what? You could save a life. And, and that's the biggest thing for us. And people are like, well, I'm not certified in CPR. And so we, we try to really simplify things. Um, we've provided um, CPR masks and AMBU bags um, with at the location where all of our uh, Narcan is so that people would feel like they're protected um, to be able to do that. Um, but if not, I'm like, pump, pump, pump you know, keep circulating with that'll keeps the oxygen going. It also circulates the um, naloxone. And so um, we have not used it yet. We've got a reporting system when that happens, um, that that goes to our department and we follow up and, and check on everything. How did it go? Um, we do have stock EpiPens in our schools. And once we implemented that um, within the first day, we um, utilized stock epi for someone that, you know, had an unknown allergy that they didn't know about. So I think these life-saving medications are important. Um, I really think too, uh, we, the education for our parents and our students about that one pill, I mean, they think that they're getting, you know, a Perc 30 out on the street, you know, a Percocet, you know, there's underlying reasons why people are searching for drugs on the street, obviously. Um, but they think that they're getting one thing. And like she said, six out of every 10 pills has fentanyl in it. It's like that chocolate chip cookie recipe thing. Um, I make these bar cookies and I love it when it's perfect in my pan, all the chocolate chips are evenly dispersed. But with fentanyl out there and the cross-contamination, um, one kid could get a pill and be fine. And the next kid could get a pill from that same batch and it could have a lot of fentanyl in it because they're not over there. It's not a controlled environment like a pharmacy. So um, I think that's the big thing. A lot of people are like, well, why are we um, enabling people to use drugs? I said, I said, you don't understand. This is not drug addicts that with needles in their arms in our schools every day. These, these are people that are getting a, a pill that could kill them. Um, and they wouldn't even realize what they're getting. And I think when people think about it like that, even adults, um, you know, can get into that with chronic pain management or depression and they're self-medicating. Um, 
anyway, I could go on and on. But thank you so much, Crystal. Excellent yeah. presentation. I'm going to change my presentation because I saw some things that you had in there. I like the simplicity of it. Um, the pictures, we are big on pictures for that, especially for lay people, because when you're in a frantic situation, um, you need something that you can look at. And we put our protocol in with every bag with the Narcan and um, and then the report of administration so that it's right there with the medication. They can pull it out, you know, the quick start guide. But then we also have our protocol with the steps. Yeah, I would, Kim, I would just Kimber, say, this is sorry, um, this is Trish. I just wondered if she wanted to go ahead and ask the question about those on the waiting list for grant money. Yeah, yes. so I'll, I'll address that. I, I'll say that um, in our hour long presentation, we do go into more depth about it being safe. Um, we do show the chocolate chip cookie um, video. So I'm glad you brought that up. So I would encourage if um, if you want to bring this to your community or bring this into schools that we do the hour long presentation, just because there's a little more meat there um, that I think, especially if there are parents in the room that they can um, relate with. We are sending out naloxone kits um, daily. And so we did get, we did order more, more money came in, we ordered more and we are sending to those on the list just as fast as we can. I know that's not a great answer. I don't know where you're at on the list, but we are trying to get down that list just as fast as we can. Thank you. Crystal, we also had a comment in the chat from Jamie, and she said that their officers, I don't know if this is school resource officers, but they're carrying them in the building, and they had two students who had overdosed, but they do think that they've saved other people. Um, when you guys make comments, can you let us know like what district you're from? I know there's a lot of us that are new, or let us know what you're representing. So, Jamie, what district are you talking about there? Uh, that's the May School District. I'm the resource officer at the high school. Um, all of our officers, including patrol officers and SROs, carry that on them. Um, and we, and that's just students that we've saved um, is the four. We've had two last year, one in each uh, semester that died from fentanyl overdose. Uh, we've done presentations. We've gone through DECA. It's a great program. Yeah, thanks for letting us know. Um, I'm so encouraged that, um, you know, of at least four that, that have been saved because my heart's always torn out when somebody thinks they're taking one thing and it was, it was that um, fatal uh, chocolate chip cookie with so much fentanyl in it. And so, um, yeah, I'm always encouraged by how many that we can save with, with, with not naloxone. This is Maureen. I have a kind of a lay person question. So just from context, I'm sort of gleaning that the naloxone, if you are ingesting something with fentanyl, the, the naloxone will help? Okay. Yeah, so um, naloxone, if you take an opioid, um, so fentanyl is an opioid, so any of the opioids, if you've taken, the naloxone will help knock that opioid off the receptor. So if, you've, if you're have if you in that overdose because of an opioid, the naloxone will help. If you've okay. not taken an opioid, because in our other presentation, it's opioid and stimulants, if you've taken a stimulant medication, the naloxone will have no effect. Okay. So it only works for, it's an opioid reversal medication. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have one for stimulants. It's only for opioids. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. That's also, though, what makes it safe to take, right? So it's only going to work if it's if it's an opioid overdose. If they're not having an opioid overdose, give it any. I mean, if, if, you, if you don't know what it is, but it looks like an overdose, give it anyway. For those of us that, you know, we're, we, we may not know. We don't know what, what's going on. Thank you, Crystal, so very, very much. Um, we, who knows, we may have you back again for um, a refresher.
on this important topic, really. And Kimber, Kimber and Jamie, thank you for your real life um, application and comments on it. So we know how it is even being used here in Kansas. Thank you. So um, sobering, but needed. All right, so let's um, go to the next thing on our agenda is an ESI conversation on emergency safety interventions by Scott Gordon. And Scott, are you with us? Yep, I'm here. I'm assuming okay. you, can, you can hear me okay. All right, Scott, you can take it away. Good morning. Give me just a moment if I can take your screen sharing away and share on my own. Make sure I share the right screen with you all. You should see just my mouse hovering over a, a slide. Is that the view you all have now? Great, thank you. Uh, so my name is Scott Gordon. I'm general counsel for the Kansas State Department of Education. Uh, as all or many of you are aware, there has been some changes to the emergency safety intervention regulations in process for years. Uh, I think we have finally reached the point, I hope we finally reached the point of getting these adopted very soon. Uh, so my purpose is to kind of update you on what most of the new language will include and what that means, as well as at the end, give you a tool that the agency has developed for school staff and, and parents to use to very easily determine uh, whether something actually is a emergency safety intervention. The changes that we're going to be talking about come about primarily because of one particular case. I think there were two of them, but one of them actually came out as a published opinion. And it, it raised the question of whether or not evacuation of, a, of other individuals from a classroom, if that was the same thing as seclusion. And without going into the details of the particular case, there was a young man, I believe he was a high school student. Um, on occasion, he had a need to be alone. Um, and staff were aware of this. Uh, this was not a one-time isolated incident, incident with this particular student. Um, and rather than placing that student into a seclusion room or into a classroom by himself, basically the, the faculty would evacuate everyone else or almost everyone else out of the classroom, but he was never completely alone. There was always one or two staff members in the classroom with that particular student. Uh, one would often be trying to coax him or de-escalate, pardon me, that's the more appropriate term, would attempt to de-escalate him while the other would be standing by the door, um, just kind of just holding it um, so that he didn't necessarily run off and cause risk of injury to himself or others. So, you know, that was that was the situation that came up um, and then the parents were dissatisfied with the result of the local evaluation. Uh, and I would tell you there are more details of that particular case. Uh, there were findings made that did not apply to, it had nothing to do with the question of whether or not the student was secluded, but that was the main issue that the state board came together with others. And there was the, the ESI task force several years ago came together. Um, and recommended certain changes. The current language of the regulation, and this was adopted years ago, defines seclusion as placing the student in a location where all of the following conditions are met. The student must be placed in the enclosed area by the school personnel. The student must be purposely isolated from adults and peers. And the student is prevented from leaving, or the student reasonably believes that they are prevented from leaving the enclosed area. That's the law of the land today. The finding that came about on that language is that the student has to have actually been placed in the enclosed area. That if the student goes into a room by himself or herself, that is not the same thing as being placed within that enclosed area. The other finding was that the student must be purposefully isolated from adults and peers. So if there's someone else in the room with the student, it is not a seclusion. That was a, an opinion that came out of my office several years ago. 
uh, from another hearing officer. Uh, I did review the opinion with her before it was published, and, and I agreed with her. That's what the law stated at the time. Uh, apparently, that was not the intent of the many of the advocates, and uh, former chairperson Jim Porter also did not agree with that's what the law should mean. So the regulation is has been changed, or at least we're trying to get it changed. I will share with you that the state legislature had passed uh, legislation several years ago, um, and there was a sunset provision within that law. And this is probably one of the few times that the sun actually set in Kansas when it comes to a law, because everyone agreed that we couldn't get the law changed with the statute still in place. So the statute sunset, the state board still has its authority to amend its own regulations, and that's what they've been working on for the past several years. So here is the newest version of the Kansas Administrative Regulations to be adopted by the State Board of Education. We have a new term. Area of purposeful isolation now means any separate space, regardless of any other use of that space, other than an open hallway or similarly open environment. So can this be a corner of a classroom that does not have its own door? Yes, or I should say, maybe. Uh, maybe you have some timeout areas in the back of the classroom or the side of a classroom where there's not a separate door, there's not separate walls for this particular area, but perhaps there is a, a temporary partition that is put up uh, for students to go and, and kind of put themselves in, in time out or, or a teacher or a para may say, why don't you go take a break over here away from everyone else? And, and you know, they use it as a form of de-escalation. So we created that, that idea of this area of purposeful isolation. To purposefully isolate someone means that school personnel are not meaningfully engaged with the student to provide instruction, okay? Uh, we're not talking about one-on-one -on -one instruction. It's literally the student is there by themselves or the student is with a teacher or a para. They're not, this isn't lesson time, right? This is primarily de-escalation and uh, control of the student to make sure everyone is safe. If any of the following occurs in that circumstance, it would be purposeful isolation. If you remove the student from a learning environment by the school personnel, that counts. If you separate the student from all or most of the peers and adults in the learning environment, that would count. So it's no longer a purely by themselves, um, but if you have done something where you have removed at least most of the people, uh, then that could be considered purposeful isolation. Uh, and then, you know, again, this idea of an area of purposeful isolation, if the student is placed there by school personnel, uh, then that would certainly count. I know that there are chat comments popping up. I'll, I'll get to those in just a moment. Unfortunately, with my view, I can't see those just yet. Uh, I promise you, I don't have very many slides. Uh, seclusion uh, will be redefined. It means placement of a student for any reason other than in school suspension or detention or any other appropriate disciplinary measure in a location where both of the following conditions are met. And I want to, to well, well, we'll talk about this and then come back to the idea of in-school suspension or detention. If school personnel have purposely isolated the student or the student is prevented from leaving or the student has reason to believe that the student will be prevented from leaving the area of purposeful isolation. So what does that mean? If the student places themselves into an area of purposeful isolation, it says, Mr. Gordon, I need, I, I don't wanna be here. I'm, I'm gonna go take a break over here uh, in the corner on the other side of the partition. Okay, fine, the student can do that. But the moment that it's made clear, okay, you're gonna sit over there and you're not allowed to leave until I tell you to come out. Uh, that would be giving them the idea or the reason to believe that they can't leave that area. There is the exception for in-school suspension or detention. So you can have a student in a classroom by themselves. Uh, I will admit briefly that yes, I may have been subject to a, a period of in-school suspension in high school. Uh, that was not because I was a risk of danger to others or for myself, I just wouldn't shut up in class. 
Um, and so ISS is still possible. Detention is still possible uh, with the changes in the, in the law. There are some additional requirements under 9142.2 that if you place the student in seclusion, you must visually observe and hear the student at all times. That change is from you must be able to see and hear the student at all times. The change is to you must actually be watching the student at all times. Um, it does also explain that the presence of another person in the area um, of purposeful isolation, or if you're observing a student from outside the area of purposeful isolation, does not create an exemption from otherwise reporting it as seclusion. By the way, this is not to say that a, a child or a student, pardon me, that in which seclusion is, is necessary and appropriate. It doesn't say you can't use that tool. You just have to report it appropriately. Um, and so just because you have to be standing outside of this area of isolation and you're watching the student, that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't report it as purposeful isolation or as seclusion, pardon me. And finally, when the student is placed or otherwise directed to an area of purposeful isolation, the student shall have reason to believe that the student is prevented from leaving. In other words, there is an assumption that if you have a nine, 10, 11, 14 year old student um, and a teacher points to the corner and says, you, you're gonna go sit over there uh, or you're, you're by yourself or, or you need to go into the, the safety room, seclusion room, whatever your school district calls it. Um, if you direct them in that manner, or you place them in that room, there is the presumption that they cannot leave the room until they get permission. And again, that was one of the, the original requirements that it's either they are prevented or they have a reason to believe that they are prevented from leaving that area of purposeful isolation. That counts as seclusion. So have we made the regulations any clearer? Probably not. They're, they, I will fully admit, um, these may not be the easiest regulations to understand in the world. We did not intentionally make them difficult. But every time we would come up with a version of what we wanted the regulations to allow and not allow, there was always a scenario that it, it seemed like it resulted in, in unintended consequences, like things would backfire. Like, well, no, that's not what we mean by seclusion. Um, or that's not what we mean, which, which you can and cannot do. So we had to make certain exceptions. So to assist, uh, what we've done, the agency has come up with the self-review tool. We have not published this on the agency website yet because candidly, the state board has not formally adopted the regulations. If and when the state board adopts the regulations as they're written, this tool is going to be published on the agency website in a way that you're actually going to be able to use it on your cell phone. Staff, while you're going through this or immediately after uh, the, the theoretical use of seclusion or restraint, you should be able to use this tool and help you evaluate, well, did we actually engage in safety uh, intervention? Hopefully this, okay, you should be able to see now, again, the question, did school personnel remove the student from the learning environment? Okay. So when you click on that link and you know, you, it's very easy. It's, it's a series of yes or no questions to help you walk through it. The scenario that I have in mind is the one that I would share with you. Um, student went into a room full of faculty, staff, students. The faculty member, one of them did close, did evacuate everyone else from the room and was holding the door closed with the faculty member in the room with the student. That's the scenario. And the question five minutes afterwards is like, well, did we engage in emergency safety intervention? So we walked through the tool. Uh, did the school personnel remove the student from the learning environment? No, because the student did that. The, the, the staff didn't. You pick no, you go to the next one. Did they separate the student from all or most peers and adults in the learning environment? Here I would say yes, because they evacuated. They got all of the other peers and adults or most of them 
out of that learning environment? But yes. Were the school personnel meaningfully engaged with the student to provide instruction? In this particular incident, and, and I, this is very case specific, right? Like every single case is going to be different. In this particular one, uh, what we found out is they were not providing instruction other than trying to help de-escalate. Uh, what does it mean to provide instruction? That's going to be a question of fact that uh, school personnel and parents are going to have to you know, decide what counts as instruction and what doesn't. If you're in the middle of a math lesson, uh, you're probably not focusing so much on trying to de-escalate a student, right? That would not be the instruction that you were expecting to provide at that time. In this particular case, everyone agreed they were not engaged to provide instruction at that time. Um, so, no. Were they prevented from leaving a location which they had been removed, uh, to which they had been removed? Again, there's assumption that they are removed from everyone else in the learning environment. In this situation, uh, yes, they were prevented because the staff member was holding the door shut. At the time, was the student subject to appropriate disciplinary measures? Well, they hadn't done anything to warrant discipline at that point. And remember, you can never use seclusion or restraint as a means to discipline a child or a student. You just can't do that. I know that that question is probably going to come up. Um, just because you do not like a student's behavior or just because you want the student to go somewhere else, that doesn't mean you get to restrain or seclude them. In this case, no, there was no discipline going on at the time. So the answer being no. The result is the student was probably subject to seclusion and the school must follow its notification policies and inform the parents. And then uh, it does have Shanna's contact uh, there at the end. And if you wanted to do it again, you would just hit recycle or reload and you could reload this, reload the tool. We are hopeful that this is going to be far more helpful in guiding schools and guiding parents on what is and is not appropriate use of ESI than relying on the language of the regulations that I just shared with you all. Um, because as you all know, regulations are really not meant for uh, Jane Q public to understand. They, they just aren't. So that being said, the last thing that I have for you um, this is kind of the, the final notes that I've shared with everyone for the past couple of years. When school districts are not sure whether or not they've engaged in emergency safety interventions, they are always going to be better off uh, ratting themselves out and telling the parents, you know what, <clears throat> this was a situation that happened in school today. Uh, we just want to let you know. And then you fill out the forms appropriately to inform the, the parents of what had actually occurred. As a warning to school staff uh, and the personnel that are in charge of this, if the school misses a deadline or notice requirements, I almost always give the parents some leniency on their deadlines to file a complaint or ask for an administrative hearing. The reason is faculty and staff, they have opportunities like this to learn what the rules are. Um, they've been given the policies or policy guidance from KSDE and from KASB. Parents don't have those opportunities. So yeah, I, I give the parents a little more leniency when if the schools are not doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and then finally, and I see this a lot, the local dispute resolutions that are already mandated in the regulations, which I've not covered today because they've been around for years, that should result in a final decision made by the local board, not just by someone that the school district assigns to review these. The purpose for that is twofold. First of all, the regulation specifically calls for a decision made by the local board because parents really wanted the school boards to know what's going on in the school. That's a large reason why the regulations were written, they were in the written the way they were in the first place. Um, and the second reason is, as a school board member, I would much rather hear about this up front and know about it up front before it reaches the general counsel's office with the State Department of Education. 
Um, you don't want is you don't want your school board to hear about this from me for the first time. It just generally doesn't go well for faculty or staff uh, if that's how the message is sent. And thirdly, I said two things, but I lied. Um, it also does provide a bit more confidence uh, in your locally elected school board if they are involved and they are aware of the actions being taken by staff. That does ensure a little bit more confidence between parents uh, and their school board members. I have, see a couple of chats up here. Uh, I have a couple of direct messages that are questions. Um, Someone asked me, would a student who is placed in ISS be a seclusion by this definition? Uh, no. Um, if you are doing that for purely disciplinary reasons, um, then no, that is exempt from seclusion. At least that's the intent. And I think those are all the questions that I have seen. Uh, I am happy to answer other, any other questions. If you've got specific scenarios, you'd like me to go back and and try the, the tool, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. Or you've got your own questions or scenarios, uh, let them rip. This is, I will try to answer them as best I can. Scott, I'd like to jump in on something, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, first of all, I did serve on that committee, but as a, a local board representative. And one of the things that, that really um, concerned us, we were looking at Lake Mary, and I, I hope everybody is familiar with that location, trying to put some rules in place that would apply to Lake Mary, which was almost an exception to school districts. But when I heard from parents, one of the great things which was not dealt with um, on local boards or local districts is why the child was actually placed into um, seclusion. And again, many, many times it was for uh, disciplinary reasons instead of the fact that the student has proven to be a danger to himself or other students or staff. I don't know if you um, really covered the, the why, um, in terms of why seclusion is needed. So Barry, if I, if I understand the question of concern correctly, and I will tell you that I've had, so we've had um, since 2016, I think, 16 or 18, uh, I've had less than a dozen administrative reviews make it as far as the State Department of Education. So really not that many in the grand scheme of the uses of ESI. There are many times, probably half the complaints that I've seen were requests for review. The issue was that the schools did a terrible job of explaining to parents, well, why was my child ever placed in seclusion in the first place? And what de-escalation techniques did you use before putting them in a seclusion? Um, and there have been findings made against schools that have said, look, if there's a legitimate reason for you to have either restrained or secluded that child, there's no reason for you to not provide that explanation to the parents. Um, so I agree with you, Betty. There, there's plenty of instances where schools may have a legitimate reason. They just do a terrible job of communicating that to parents, which is a problem. Um, as far as the other school that you referenced, I think the reason why there's such an exception or a belief that there's an exception to that one is these rules only specifically apply to the accredited schools. They do not apply to residential programs. They, we just don't have any authority over uh, residential programs. And I think the one that you're referring to is. Actually, uh, um, and, and, and I won't focus on, on Lake yeah. Mary, but they did come under uh, the purview of, of those guidelines. My point being just in, in public schools, and you did touch upon that, Scott, um, because it was a big problem with parents not being made aware that um, number one, the, that seclusion had occurred and number two, the why. And I didn't know if, if that was something that was immediately understood in terms of why would you use seclusion versus um, 
ISS or, or some other disciplinary means. Uh, there were times it was used for disciplinary reasons and I just wanted that underscored. Yeah, yeah, I will tell you that those that's been an issue that's been in the regulation since day one, and that just comes with training. Uh, and yeah, I think it just comes from training and additional findings made by uh, me uh, when it comes up. But you're right; there are no, there were no changes made. Uh, if if yeah, there were no changes made to the regulations. I don't think specific to that particular issue because it's already in the regulation. Any other questions or scenarios? Uh, as far as, just very quick, um, so where we are in the process now, I was really hoping that by now I would have uh, news resulting from the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules and Regulations. We were on the docket to be heard a couple of weeks ago. I think it was, maybe it was only a week ago. Uh, for whatever reason, the these regulations were tabled until I think the next time the joint committee meets is March 3rd. Hopefully I'll have the opportunity to present these regulations to that committee at that time and find out what kind of feedback they have. These are set to go before the State Board of Education for a vote in May. The public hearing will take place on the Tuesday portion of the public or of the, the regularly scheduled board meeting. And then the board is scheduled to vote on Wednesday. On, on whether or not to formally adopt these regulations. So that, that's basically the update that I have for you. Um, if you have any other questions or concerns, my email contact information is there at the end. Thank you so much, Scott. That is really, really helpful. And that new tool that you developed, um, gosh, that will help, um, I think, people go step by step through what had to happen. And if not, I mean, if they're still confused, they'll get hold of you. <laughs> but what a great tool. Which you. And I, hopefully it helps. Yeah, good. Thank you for today's presentation. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for having me. You'll take you care. You bet. Okay. So we need to take a break. We have been going at it with such good information. Okay, so let's come back at 10.55, um, five minutes till 11, okay? And we will start right up then because we're a few minutes behind, but let's go till 10.55, come back and we will start with legislative updates from Craig Neuenschwander, all right? Okay, everybody, have a good break.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had as good a muffin as I did on your break. <laughs> it was blueberry and it was great. Thank you for coming back right on time. And um, we are going to jump right to Craig Neuenschwander. Did I say that right, Craig? That's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, that, whether you said it right or not depends on which family member you ask. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. And we are ready for your legislative update. Okay, um, if I can share my screen, I've got some slides I'll, I'll show you. Okay. Hopefully. And are you seeing my PowerPoint now, Jane? Okay. So a little update. First of all, a uh, little explanation about where they are in the session. They are working just as hard as they can to get to turnaround. Technically, tomorrow is the date uh, known as turnaround, which means all the bills move out of the chamber they originated in and then start all over in the opposite chamber next week. So House is trying to pass bills on the floor and uh, get them moved over to the Senate and vice versa. Um, so I'm just going to, to go through, I say they technically do it tomorrow. They're going to do the best they can to be done tonight so they can get out of town and, and not have to work all day tomorrow. Um, but that's kind of the more or less halfway mark, not technically by the calendar, but they're in the middle of their session. So I'll just review some of the bills that are on the floor or have been passed. Uh, and then a few that have been blessed. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So for starters, House Bill 2238 is the Fairness in Women's Sports Act. And this is at least the second year, might be the third year for this bill. Uh, it has passed in years prior and been vetoed by the governor. And that's, that is up for final action today on the floor of the House. Uh, and it, it uh, as you're probably well aware, limits participation in women's sports to those who were uh, born female, uh, and, and no changes allowed. House Bill 2060 create, doesn't really create it. It brings back a special education task force that was in statute uh, maybe 30 years ago. And the purpose of that task force would be to look at special education funding and is the current formula the best we can do? Do we need to have something different? Uh, it would consist of about 10 members, most appointed by legislators, but the state board would appoint one member. The State Department of Ed would appoint two members, and there would be a parent on the committee. Um, that is being uh, moved forward off the floor of the House. In fact, that's already passed through the House and is on its way to Senate Education Committee. House Bill 2080 allows virtual students to take the state assessment online. Currently, if a virtual student's going to take the state assessment or when the virtual student takes the state assessment, they have to come in to a given spot and take it where it can be monitored. This bill allows them to take it from the comfort of their own home on their computer. Um, to do that and provide test security is relatively expensive because you have to come up uh, with an alternate version of the assessment, uh, ultimate alternate items. The bill, however, was amended in committee before it went to the floor. And the committee simply stated, no, they'll take the same assessment that they would take otherwise online. And any costs will be absorbed by the State Department of Education within our budget. So the issue with that, if they're taking the same assessment that everybody else takes, and there is no security provided, Nothing prevents the student or parent or whoever happens to be home from copying an item and posting it out on Facebook, Twitter, wherever the case might be, social media. If that happens, according to Beth Foltz, our assessment expert, let's assume it's a sixth grader that does that, posts one item online for everybody to see, that invalidates the entire sixth grade state assessment. So we have no results for sixth graders that year. 
So that's a significant issue, but that's the way the bill sits right now, and it is up for final action today on the floor of the House. Uh, 2322 is a little bit of a technical cleanup. It just changes the language for special education uh, programming. Rather than uh, describing students with an emotional disturbance, we would replace that with emotional disability. 2292 was just amended yesterday on the floor of the house. The original bill uh, provided apprenticeships in a number of different occupations. Yesterday on the floor of the house, they amended it to include teachers and then moved the bill forward. So they, they will vote on final action on that today. Uh, a school district employee, a para, uh, any other employee you have that wanted to become a licensed teacher could participate in the apprenticeship program and work their way up to licensure uh, as they continue employment in the district. So that has some, some potential, uh, hopefully, to help with the current shortage uh, that we experience and everybody else does as well. 2081 created a scholarship for high school kids who wanted to teach, again, trying to help with our shortage, based on the uh, criteria that would describe it, our, future, our uh, current teachers of the year. They had that up to be voted on yesterday on the floor of the House, and for whatever reason, they passed over the bill and did not vote. It's still on the calendar, but they're not scheduled to take action today. So we'll have to watch and see what happens to that bill as, as we move forward. Uh, Senate Bill 66 create, uh, would have Kansas join a federal compact uh, with a number of states that would allow teachers moving in from out of state to be licensed much more easily without going through some of our processes initially. After they've taught for a while and it's time to renew the license, then they have to meet our criteria. Uh, so that has passed through the Senate and would, would be on its way to the House. The state board discussed that prior to the legislative session and did not take any action on it, uh, pro or con. And, and most of you are probably well, are well aware, constitutionally licensure is an issue for the state board rather than the legislature. Uh, but it's a little mixed bag because compacts are normally adopted by the state legislature. Senate Bill 82 deals with concussion management in school districts, uh, creating a, a uh, committee within the district in a way to, to ensure that students return to school safely if they've had a, a concussion. There are some things in statute now, this beefs that up just a little bit. Senate Bill 83 expands, if you don't know that acronym, the Tax Credit for Low-Income Student Scholarship Program. So that's the program that allows individuals and corporations to donate money to a scholarship training organization. And the scholarship training organization then can provide a scholarship to low-income students to attend private schools uh, if they qualify. The amount of money donated to the scholarship training organization, currently 70% of that amount counts as a tax credit for that individual uh, on their finances. This would expand it so that 100% of what you donate becomes a tax credit. You just cut it off of the amount you owe in income taxes to the state of Kansas. It also expands the number of students that would be eligible. Uh, it would no longer be limited to free and reduced price lunch. That income criteria would increase to 250%, uh, which for comparison, 250% of the poverty level, I'm sorry, finish that thought. For comparison, the reduced price standard is 185% of the federal poverty level. So it expands the number of students that are eligible and it expands it on up to high school students. Prior to now, it's been limited to K through eight. Now we go on up through high school. Could participate in that program. That is moving through the Senate and will be voted on final action today. There are other bills then that can be blessed is what they're known as in the legislature. There are certain committees that are exempt. Uh, 
State and Federal Affairs, Appropriations Committee, Ways and Means, Assessment and Taxation. Any bill that's been in that committee is exempt. So it is not uncommon when you reach turnaround to move a bill to that committee, one of those committees for a day, and then back to their regular committee. That makes them blessed and they stay alive, even though they haven't voted on it. Uh, so these bills have been blessed and will still be alive when their legislature returns next week from turnaround. 2271 was a simple little bill that would allow non-resident children in your school district if their parent works for you to enroll and attend regardless of the open enrollment bill that was passed a year ago. So I'll try to clean that up a little bit. The way they defined open enrollment a year ago, a school district has to determine what your capacity is in each classroom. And then when students from other districts want to attend, they apply and you hold a lottery to decide who gets in. There's no picking and choosing, no setting criteria about who can attend and who can't. It's just strictly by luck of the draw in the lottery. Well, a number of districts pointed out to their legislators, if we're employing somebody that lives in another district, we allow their children to come to school in our district. That helps us recruit and attract employees and keep them. Uh, so legislators listened and they made, a, made this bill this session so that they could allow that to happen adjusted the Open Enrollment Act. All well and good. Um, our folks here at the agency realized that doing allowing non-resident students to attend only by lottery potentially runs into a conflict with the McKinney-Vento language about homeless students that must be allowed to attend in their district of origin if they happen to be misplaced for a while. So they took some language over to the committee. The committee agreed and amended that in. So we're safe as far as McKinney-Vento. Then they added an amendment that created a parent portal on every school district's website. And among other things, on that portal, every school district would have to post their curriculum for each grade level on the portal. Uh, they're very careful to say this is not asking for lease and plans, it's asking for your curriculum. That was amended into the bill. There was some concern among committee members that that doesn't really have anything to do with this bill, and we've never talked about it before. But nevertheless, it was amended. The bill passed committee, uh, and it has been blessed and will stay alive now, even though it hasn't been worked on the floor of the House yet. 2218 creates an education savings account, uh, which would be available to any to the parents of any student attending private school. Uh, the way it's written, it's for any student who's to, to be eligible, the student has to be eligible to enroll in public school. So it doesn't say they have to enroll, they just have to be eligible to enroll. Well, anybody is eligible to enroll in public school. So all private school students would be able to participate in this. Anybody that transfers to a private school would be able to participate. And what they receive then is an education savings account each year in the amount of the base that's paid to public school districts uh, for their general fund. So next year, that would be $5,103. The parent would have 95% of that amount put into their account. The state treasurer would have 5% of that amount because the treasurer would have responsibility for overseeing all of those individual accounts and managing the program. And the student then could, could use that money to pay tuition to a private school, to pay for tutoring services, anything along those lines. If the student enrolls in public school per, uh, full time, um, then that's it. They're no longer eligible for the account. They did amend it. Uh, but that comes, you can imagine, there are 26,000 students in accredited private schools. We don't know how many there are in non-accredited private schools because they're not required to report that to us. So you can imagine the price tag at $5,000 a student runs high pretty quickly. Um, so to alleviate that a little bit, they amended it in committee so that it's phased in on 
over a four-year time period based on income. So low-income students would be eligible the first year, and then you keep increasing it until eventually everybody attending private school would be eligible. That has also been blessed. House Bill 2048 was blessed. It's the same tax credit, low-income scholarship program expansion that the Senate uh, is working to pass now. So same bill, one in the Senate, one in the House. It's not unusual for them uh, to do that with bills if uh, they've got legislators in both the chambers interested. So it will be alive both places. Another set of bills that's been blessed. House Bill 2030 would allow private school students to participate in public school activities. Uh, there are some exceptions built into that. The public school may require them to attend at least one class in the public school. Uh, but other than that, if I'm attending my uh, home school and I want to uh, play ball or participate in debate, with the local high school, I would have the right to do that. House Bill 2040 would make a change in the way school districts are funded. Currently, when you count enrollment for your funding, you use the prior year or the second preceding year, whichever is higher. So your current year enrollment doesn't count. The reason for that is to allow planning. The district knows what their enrollment is, they know what they're going to have, and the legislature knows what the enrollment is. They don't have to worry about coming back the following year and finding out, gee, we didn't allocate enough money. A number of years ago, the formula used to count the current year. And if you are a district that's growing, that means all these new students you bring in next year are not gonna be funded for another year. So they would very much like to have the current year enrollment counted. 2040 makes that change. So it has not passed on the floor of the House yet, but it has been blessed. So it will stay alive until after turnaround so that you can, districts could use the current year, the prior year, or the second preceding year, whichever's higher. 2261 is an interesting little bill. Uh, it allows local school board members to be compensated for their school board member duties. Currently, you, you, you may well be aware, they are the only elected officials in the state of Kansas that are not paid for their position. Legislators, state board members, county commissioners, city council members, they're all paid for those duties. Local school board members are not. This bill would allow them to be paid. And it has been blessed, so it will stay alive. And then finally, a bill that, that uh, will probably be of interest for this group it has just been put together, and I don't know the bill number yet. It may be out there, I just haven't seen it. But it will be a House bill that makes funding for the mental health intervention team program permanent. So we don't have to go year by year waiting for an appropriation to come out to know if they're going to continue that program or not. Um, making it permanent comes with a few changes, minor changes. Uh, well, minor from my viewpoint, it may be major for some school districts. The amount that liaisons are paid right now by the state is currently 75% of what their salary is. So the, for, for the mental health intervention team program, school districts hire a liaison uh, to work between the community mental health center, the parents, the school district, keep that process flowing and 75% of the salary is covered by the state. And then one third of that amount goes to the community mental health center. In making it permanent, the salary uh, is paid up to $50,000, period. No 75%, nothing else. Up to $50,000, the salary will be reimbursed to the district. If you choose to pay more than that, which many do and should, that's fine, but the state's only going to 50,000. And then one third of 50,000 would go to the community mental health center. So that would be a little bit of a change. Other than that, uh, for the most part, they tried to mirror the current criteria in the mental health intervention team grant that has been awarded for the last five years. So that will be worth watching. That's going to be introduced through the appropriations committee. So it will be a blessed bill and will stay alive. And I believe, 
Oh, one, one thing to show you. So I've gone through all these wonderful bill numbers and just a brief capsule on it. If you want to know more about any of them, you can go to the School of Finance website for KSDE. And there is a link there for legislation. If you follow that link, you'll find a link for bills being followed. And that will give you a thumbnail description of every bill that we're following that has to do with education, not just the ones I just threw up on the list. If you want to know the full text of any of these bills we just talked about, uh, to see specifically what's involved in the tax credit for low-income student scholarship program, you can go to the legislature's website. And on the left-hand side near the top, there's a little blue box that says bills. Click on that box, type in the number of the bill you're interested in. You don't need HB or SB, you just need 2040. And it will take you to a page that has a PDF of that full bill. You can open that up and, and read everything you ever wanted to know about it. It will tell you where the bill is, what committee it was in, where it's been moved to, and you can track its progress. So with that, I will stop sharing. And if anybody's had any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Uh, or if there's other information you want to know. So first Greg, thing I we have a few hands up, but we also have some comments in the chat. Okay. Do we know the status of 2407 student surveys? Um, Kemp, was that the one uh, that that basically tried to undo what was passed last yeah, year? Yeah, it, it was introduced in uh, child welfare and foster care. And there yeah. was a hearing this week, eight proponents, one opponent. And essentially what it would do, it, it would bring us back to opt out rather than opt in. Uh, I don't know if it got out of committee or not, did it? Do you know? As far as I know, using Mayo Bennis's description, it is still resting quietly in the committee. All right, thank you. You bet. Um, oh, on it. does this violate federal security requirements? I assume that's the uh, virtual assessments. Um, there would not be a violation until somebody actually posted an item or was caught cheating on the on the test. Then that would be a violation, and that's why we would end up with no results at that grade level. The whole thing gets thrown out. Any other questions? Craig, this is Judy Rodman. I had a question and excuse me if I missed it. I, I was pulled into a situation here in the office for a moment, um, but I was wanting to know about Senate Bill 12. Um, and so that was a bill and I don't know if it's being followed by the school district, but that was the, the bill that was introduced by Mike Thompson from Shawnee about um, transgender healthcare, gender affirming healthcare, and the proposal about anyone that's um, a licensed professional providing any type of supportive gender affirming healthcare for anybody under the age of 21 could, could face legal um, concerns. Um, and so just as, as we're here as the school mental health advisory um, council, knowing that transgender individuals about 50 percent experience suicidal ideation and we're talking about suicidal ideation for for individuals in our schools i think it's something important for us to be aware of and sure. that we have licensed social workers and counselors um, that support individuals in our schools um so we have not been following that bill but i can see on the website it had a hearing on the 14th and nothing's been done with it since then. So they haven't worked it, which means they haven't tried to move it out of committee yet. And I do believe it's in two different committees right now. Ah, okay. Uh, last action here on this website, uh, it was withdrawn from judiciary and okay. referred to the public health and welfare committee as well as judiciary. So you're right, it is in two different committees. Um, Double your pleasure, double your fun, I guess. But neither one has worked the bill yet. And neither of those committees is an exempt committee. So theoretically, it may be done after this week. Uh, but one thing 
you learn if you follow the legislature and nothing's ever really dead. There's always a way to bring it back. Yes, Kim, Kimber, you're right. Nurses also, nurses and any healthcare provider also falls under that. Any other questions? I can tell you I don't know much about. <laughs> Dr. Craig, this Maureen, I'm selfishly wondering um, for House Bill 2271 with the McKinney-Vento language, and maybe this is just a conversation that we can have outside of this platform, but um, what what happens next? I mean, you had it in that category of, you know, that, that, that blessed category, but what happens to it next? Where does it go from here? Um, let me see exactly. If I remember correctly, committee passed the bill, didn't they? Mm -hmm. I know they did, after they put that amendment in. So it's on the calendar for the House. And what that means is it will stay on that calendar until such time as the Speaker of the House decides to move it up on the general orders. And they can discuss it and vote yes or no at that time. Okay. Sometimes it just stays on the calendar forever. <laughs> Sometimes the Speaker will send it back to another committee for further amendment. Okay. Or they will, when they get near the end of the session, um, they start putting bills together and cutting things out of this bill and amending it into that one. So that that's kind of a long wind of saying just about anything could happen from this point forward. But okay. technically, where it is, is on the agenda for the House to be pulled up and voted on at some day when the Speaker determines it appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. That um, is a lot um, for us to be updated on. And thanks, thanks for the link so that we can go explore and for our uh, pleasure reading, read some of those bills. <laughs> I'm sure that's what you're looking forward to this weekend. So yeah. happy reading. <laughs> thanks, Craig. All Thank right. You. Yeah. Okay, let's keep moving to the foster care report card by Doug Boleyn. Doug, are you on? I am. Hooray, great, Doug. Good to see you. Yeah, let's see if I can uh, share my screen. And hopefully you can see the report card. So um, this is the report card that basically it's KSDE's, KSDE's data that we uh, put together and provide to DCF. And then they are the ones that are actually responsible for presenting it to the legislature. So they're the ones tasked with it, but uh, most of this is our data. Um, so I'll just kind of walk you through that. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, the first part is just the demographics of students in foster care um, based on race, ethnicity. Uh, you'll see that 60% approximately are white, 16% uh, Hispanic, 12.5% uh, African-American, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we look at attendance rate. So that's basically our average daily attendance rate. You can see that foster students for all students uh, is at 88%, whereas our state average is 92%. Uh, if we look at graduation data, all foster students graduated about 59.3%, whereas our state average uh, last year was 89.3%. So foster students graduating uh, at a rate 30% less than all students in the state. Dropout rate, uh, once again, foster students at 5%, whereas our, our state average is 1.4, so a little over three times the dropout rate for students in foster care as it is for um, across the state. And then chronic absenteeism, uh, which is, I believe it's 10% 10 10 or more days missed. Um, for absences, students in foster care, 
43% uh, of those students are chronically absent, whereas our state average is 25.4. Then as we look at state assessment results, um, we've got the last three years on here, obviously in 2020, uh, we didn't have state assessments because of COVID. So we only have data for 21 and then last spring in 22. As you look at this, you'll see that uh, in levels one and two for students in foster care, all, all foster care students, 90% uh, of students score in those bottom two categories, whereas the state uh, average is 70%, so 20% more there for foster students. And that is for the math assessment, sorry. And uh, the NAs just mean that we have we don't have enough students in those different categories that we can give numbers. We have to suppress the numbers. So that's what the NAs represent as we go through these. Uh, ELA, English language arts, uh, you can see that students in foster care in levels one and two is 86% whereas the state average is 64.8 um, of our students are in, in one and two. And then for science, uh, 87% of all students in foster care score in those first two levels, whereas our state average is 65%. And I did make this available to Gail this morning um, that she can share it with, with the committee uh, if you're interested in that, taking a look at this in, in further depth. Um, academically prepared for post-secondary success is actually looking at it in the reverse. Uh, how many of our students uh, are scoring in levels three and four, which are considered proficient. And so, um, as you look at all foster students for ELA, it's 13% are considered uh, prepared for post-secondary success where the state average is 32%. For math, 9.7%, uh, state average is 29. And then for science, 12.8, uh, and the state average is 31. The next um, chart represents the percentage of students, uh, foster care students that are enrolled in the uh, MIT program, Mental Health Intervention Team program. I, I think this data may, I'm not sure it's a true reflection because it measures the number in the program against all students in foster care and I think maybe as I was looking at this, one of the things we probably should figure out is how many foster students are in those 56 districts that are participating in the program and figure a percentage based on that instead of the total number of foster students, because the way it's calculated here, only 6.6% uh, are partici participating in the program, but that's spread out across the whole state, not um, just focused on those 56 districts. So I think that's probably one that we should take another look at. Um, preschool enrollment, the number of students in foster care that are eligible or, or that are of that age, and then how many of them are actually um, participating. We can only measure those that are involved in a school-sponsored pre-K program. That's the only data we have. We don't. We can't access uh, private entities. But I, I think that still looks pretty good. That 82% of of uh, children in that preschool age are involved in a school-based program. So. Um, I think if you factored in the private ones, it, it might be a little bit higher. Um, I tried to get a feel for how that compares to the state, but they ran into the same problems in trying to figure out the percentage of 
all pre-K students across the state, how many are involved in a program. And there's so many different ones that we just don't have data for that it's a little hard to make that calculation. Um, next chart has to do with promoted to the next grade level. Uh, the first chart is broken out by race. Uh, you see that almost 90% of, of students in foster care do progress to the next grade level as we look year to year. Um, and then it's also broken out by um, grade level then. So we're looking at upper 80s to mid 90s are progressing to the next grade level. Um, once kids get to high school, I think if you compare that to all groups, you're going to see a drop. It's not just in foster care, but um, it is a little bit alarming that as they get closer to graduation, um, they're not progressing. And then the next few charts have to do with discipline. Um, this data, I, I believe, only represents half a year uh, in the discipline data collection. We didn't have a way to identify students in foster care originally, and we got that put into place last spring. So I believe this only represents um, about a semester's worth of data as, as far as um, suspend in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, and uh, expulsions. Um, and as we look at this, I, th I, th I think we see the same trend that we see in all of our discipline data that students of color are more likely to be uh, suspended or expelled. And that is all of the data we have for foster care. So I'd take any questions and try to answer any that you might have. Doug, this is Diane. I put a, um, a question in the chat box. Um, obviously, the assessments of L1 and L2 is really upsetting. <laughs> distressing. Um, are your committees looking at the mobility of kids and how often they're moved from school district to a different school district and perhaps any impacts on that on achievement? I know that DCF tracks that or or they're they're trying to. It's not data that we can easily come up with. We've talked, we have multiple populations of students in the state, migrant, homeless, uh, foster, military that are mobile, but we just don't have a great way at this time to track that and, and make that comparison. But I think that's a good point. Doug, I know that Dr. Newswander didn't mention it, but there is a House Bill 2371, or I might have missed it, but I know that there's a House Bill out there that speaks specifically to um, child welfare and foster care, um, and it talks about adding, um, well, setting a limit on the number of the caseload that um, DCF social workers um, can have at 18, uh, 18 foster families that they can work with. And that would require hiring, you know, another 70 plus social workers to make that happen. Um, have you heard anything around increasing the number of staff that are going to be able to work with these foster families? Um, I have not. We, we have a committee or a group that meets regularly, well, once a month, um, that involves KSDE and, and DCF staff where we just talk through foster care issues and, and different things that we're seeing. I know that they have a hard time um, employing people, keeping them employed. There's a lot of turnover, uh, yeah. same with, with teaching. I mean, um, but no, that has never come up in any of our discussions that I've been involved in. 
seems like you know reducing the caseload for some of those folks would actually increase their ability to retain you know some of those employees it makes sense okay thank you Doug in the chat Angie had mentioned that she would be willing to discuss the MHIT stats and she has data that could reflect numbers that you were talking about if anybody was interested Angie if you want to speak more on that Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm in transit, so that's why you're not seeing me. Bandwidth issues. Um, yeah, Doug, I'd be happy to meet with you uh, to discuss our numbers. Uh, you are correct. Uh, MHID is only in, um, I believe, right now, 57 school districts. So I think those stats, um, those numbers could change, um, and I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Thanks. And I, I did print off the list of the of the districts that are um, part of the program, but I don't have student numbers that go with it. I just know who they are. I know they hit a, several of our big districts where we do have large concentrations of, of foster students, but I know it doesn't add up to that 5,300. Any other yeah. questions for Doug? Thank you, Doug, for sharing um, that report. It, it is good to know how much is tracked and the data that you have for uh, foster students so that we can take some action. Thank you. All right, bye Doug. Okay, let's move to agency updates by Bert. I'm gonna see if Carrie has anything she'd like to share first. Carrie, do you have anything you wanna share? I think she said no through the wall. Um, so I think she was muted. So I will share one thing that we as an agency are working on. Uh, it's a cross team uh, view of chronic absenteeism. When you see the numbers for students that miss 10% or more of the school days, now consider that a district has maybe 180 days. 10% is 18 days or more. And we have agencies that are up to 37% of their students have chronic absenteeism. So when you're looking at assessment scores and you compare it to how much seat time students are receiving in classrooms, it's a frightening statistic because I have to have the thought in my mind that if you're not there, you're not picking up content and teachers don't have the time to go back and reteach every concept and so we have a lot of students that are missing out on content instruction, and that's across all curriculum areas. And it is concerning. So Dr. Robin Kelso is our uh, chronic absenteeism person here at KSDE, and we are working with a, a TA center called the SEAC Center, and they are assisting us to look at our chronic absenteeism and come up with a plan on how to address it. So I'll be able to report more on that in the future, but I think you all need to know that mental health concerns and bullying of students we've heard has created in some students a lack of wanting to be at school or in school. And so our counselors, our school psychologists, all of our mental health professionals that work in schools, they're taxed to the limits with trying to provide the supports and services to children. And then on top of that, they're supposed to be trying to find these students that are chronically absent due to mental health concerns and issues. Um, it's pervasive. COVID created a huge problem for us. We had a lot of students that were isolated from peers. We have a lot of preschoolers and kindergartners that we understand do not have appropriate behaviors and attention spans as a result of having to have point and service right on that computer and now they're facing a classroom with standard instruction 
and it is causing problems for our teachers. The other issue we're facing is the shortage of teachers. At one point this year, we had over 1,600 openings, over 350 in special education. Now, can you imagine that you're sending your child to kindergarten or first grade and you have an emergency substitute in that classroom, which means that person doesn't even have the qualifications to be teaching truly unless they've gone to school and at least started in a program. And now that's the person that's teaching your child. Does anybody see anything down the pike that could be a problem for these students that are in these classrooms that don't have the skilled educators? We also, I was talking to uh, someone in Wichita yesterday, has over 300 openings right now. I think it was 600. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's unfathomable. It's uh, just the saddest situation uh, for our state and our nation to be in, because it's not just Kansas, it's universal. And then when you hear what Dale presented about what's happening across the street from us here at KSDE, and the bills being introduced to send the public money to private schools and to support private school enrollment, it doesn't say much about supporting public education in the state of Kansas. So we have to build support for public education and we have to build better support for mental health in schools where we had limitations set on us through House Bill 2567. And I don't think that anybody across the street would knowingly try to harm children. But sometimes I just can't understand the logic of where these ideas come from and what the ultimate outcome is. Do they just want public school to go away? Do they want us all to become private schools so that we all can get this money? It's scary to me. But as far as the agency is concerned, we are having a school improvement team in the Division of Learning Services. They met this morning. We're coming up with some focal points, some focus that we can all agree on, and then establish that and work with the field to try and generate support for a model that ultimately leads to better student achievement for all of our students, because we're highly concerned about the number of students that are not scoring well on, this, on the state assessments. And it, the trend line is not good. So we're addressing how we can raise the level one students. And we broke the level one into a top half and a bottom half. And we feel that there's so many limitations for children that are in that bottom quartile that we have to try and get the top half, at least of level one to level two, which we, we think would meet the requirements of a student being able to go on for post-secondary success. A large number of students in level one. And we're trying to address that here at the agency as well. We have come up with some alternate monitoring. Um, it's actually the same monitoring requirements as a school system for correctional facilities and jails that house adult students, because it's one of the things that we're required to do. So uh, Brian Dempsey's team through Stacy Martin and the neglected and delinquent EPC here at KSDE, Heather Gould are going out and performing monitoring of uh, correctional facilities and adult jails. There's about 39 of them. So that's something we could report out on as soon as we've done some of those visits and give you better information on what's happening there. Uh, I'm looking at my list. I'd like to end on some really good news. Um, some of our team met with legislative post audit yesterday to uh, look at evidence-based practices and how our agency defines an evidence-based practice. So we'll be able to report more on that at a later time, but we had an audit about three years ago, and we designed our uh, spreadsheets and our information that you'll find online on the ksde.org website and look under evidence-based practices and you will find an acceptable list, but it's kind of a plethora of things and we would like to be more specific. So we're gonna be working here at SETS team, which is my team, to try and get the uh, CSAS team, Career Standards and Assessments team involved in helping us to establish what is evidence-based practice for the instruction of reading, for the instruction of English, instruction of uh, social sciences, et cetera so that we're more broad 
uh, scoped around evidence-based practices. So we're working on that as well. But I do want to let you all know that we are focused on student achievement for each student. I used to say all students. All students doesn't say that we're equitable. Because if I do it for all, did I do it the right way for those students that need a different form of access? Probably not. So I really need to do it for each student so that I'm designing programs and services for the needs of each student that I have. And I used to tell my teachers, when you signed your contract, you were not contracted to work with the top half of the students in your class. You were contracted to work with each student in your class. That kind of woke them up a little bit. So it wasn't this silo, that silo, my class, your class. It was more of, I am accountable and responsible for each student. So Jane, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to because we are running out of time and we need to get to our next issue. And I'm right on time at 1145. So I'm going to kick it back to you. Thank you, Bert. It is, uh, it's encouraging and consoling to know that you're at the helm of new work there and um, really looking at school improvement and really looking at the success of each student. It truly is. We are thankful um, that you're part of all of that. And yeah, in the future, we'll want to hear more about that work for sure about you. Okay, so we're at council member updates. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to um, address the public comment from Melanie this morning about um, the, the uh, revisions or recommendations for the um, suicide toolkit. So I think, um, you know, she's written out the recommendations and I've heard from a couple of you that you'd be willing to um, meet together, to talk about, to review, to look at those recommendations. Um, Bert and Carrie, would you suggest that that would be the next move that several of those people interested um, and know, knowledgeable about um, the toolkit, meet with Melanie and go over those revisions? What would you suggest? Well, here's what I'm suggesting. I think there's enough interest that we need to form a subcommittee here within our team. Okay. We don't wanna be so broad that we can't get any work done, but I do wanna emphasize one thing. This is a toolkit, it is not a requirement. Suicide Toolkit means it's established and put out there for you to pull from whatever works for you. It does not, it does not stand in lieu of local policy. So you can set any local policy that you want. You can pull anything out of this toolkit that you want and use it. You do not have to apply it word for word and item for item. When we give you surveys, you can change that survey any way you want to, Melanie. You can take things out of it. You can take it and revamp it and do it the way that you feel that you need to do it for your agency. So I wanted you all to know it's a guidance document. It is not legal binding requirement. That's why it's called a toolkit. If there are ways that we could improve it so that it is more manageable and easier for people in the field to utilize, then by gum, let's do that. But at the same time, I don't want anybody to think that we're letting kids commit suicide because of a toolkit item that we put out there that's confusing to the field. Please remember, it is a guidance document. Carrie, you were going to say something. Well, I was just going to say, I, I agree with you, Bert. Thanks for emphasizing that, that part of it. And that the, uh, the school, the council's the leadership team we have internally that supports the council uh, will uh, can take this under advisement and we'll look at how the best way to see that we should proceed on this because it has been five years. Or yeah, so 2019. Since, since, but, yeah, 2019 was when it was published and we would have started drafting it probably a year or so before that. So it was, uh, dirt, you know, so it's a, a logical time for it to be updated. So appreciate. I agree. I do agree, though, that we can pull people from the 
That's why we have this advisory council. And that's why we appreciate you so much so that we can pull some of you together uh, with Kent Reed, with uh, myself, with Trish, who's got a high interest with you, Jane, as the uh, vice chair. We could ask Betty to be involved as well. But it's that idea that we have a conversation about it and we take into consideration not only what Melanie shared, but does anybody else have any input in it that we could improve the document? Because when we open it, we want to open all of it so that when we look at it, we're looking at the totality of it based upon the current trend and current needs in our state. And so, and many of you on here aren't familiar with how it was developed. Uh, so it was developed uh, with a specific purpose in mind and with by a specific group uh, with um, national feedback and based off of the national documents and evidence base at the time. And the school mental health, it was one of the first uh, activities that were actually thrust upon the uh, school mental health professional development and coaching team as they were, before they had even actually uh, formed, uh, they were still forming uh, when this was put on their plate. But Melanie also brought up a great point. House Bill 2567 really confused the field in what they could and couldn't do. And she's asking for us to provide clarification to the field. And I think that is a responsibility that we need to address. To exactly. at least yeah. But, and that's why I would we, question whether it goes in that document or not. We'd have to. I would, when we were I, drafting this, we had no concept that that would even be yeah, John. something that we would have to address. Did I hear correctly that Craig Nineswander said that the way they're looking at it now is instead of parents signing something saying they're going to opt in is now if parents want to opt their kids out. So we've kind of gone back to that. Is that the newest revision? I thought that's what I heard. You heard him say that, but it will not get out of the House or the Senate. House Bill 2407 uh, uh, undoes what House Bill 2567 did. But you're right, Bert. It's just sitting in in committee right now. It's not. Sitting it's quietly. not going anywhere. They they did that on purpose, because uh, this group is saying that parents have the right to decide what the mental health needs of their children are, and that the school should not be involved in the parents' role. I'm just kind of giving you ad litem what I have picked up from House Bill 2567. But at the same time, we have kids that have needs in our schools. They have mental health needs and they're presenting those. And we have parents who sometimes are ignoring those. And people say, well, call DCF. Well, DCF goes in the house. Do they have food in the refrigerator? Do they have heat on? Do they have four walls? And sometimes that's as far as it gets. And I'm sorry, anybody from DCF, but I've worked with DCF and when I was in the school system. And we had kids that we knew were not getting their needs met. But that's pretty much how, how it ended up when they did their review. I would like, to, go ahead. I would like to just on record make sure that um, I'm added to that committee, that subcommittee, please. I think it's really important. Um, as somebody who's been working with and researching the trends in schools over the last five years, I would like to be part of that. And additionally, um, hearing from um, principals and counselors and doing consultations three to five times a week on suicidal ideation. I think it's just a growing trend that we have to address in the sensitivity. Um, I don't think that, and I'm going to probably overspeak for Melanie. I don't think that she was trying to impart that anyone was not sensitive to what students were needing. I think it was more of a demand of these are the trends and we need to update and make sure that we're providing clear support to to schools that are dealing with crisis on a daily almost hourly basis at times so i think that it is very time sensitive and i'd like to be part of that what we'll do jane is just ask anyone who'd like to be a part of that to send us uh, an email they can send that to me or they can send it to kayla probably to kayla or gail let's get gail involved in this because gail is our new aa so gail trip uh, you can locate her on here and we'll get her email out there and just let people know that you're interested. And at some point in time, we can pull a committee meeting, a subcommittee meeting of this group together and have a discussion because that's what I've heard we need to do. And that's in our bylaws that we're allowed to do that. 
Great idea, Bert. Yes, because I mean, I, I know there's five or six people that have um, a really strong interest in that. So yeah, uh, KS KSPHQ um, would also like to be involved as sort of the suicide prevention subject matter experts in the state. Um, so if, if, if we can be involved in that as well, that would be great. Erica, I thought I it would be Erica. I did too. Send it to Gail. There's her yeah. G-T-R-I-P-P at KSDE.org. Just send it to her and that's what we'll work off of. That's right. Great. And thanks for all of your interest. It will only get better. It only gets better. All right. So now let's just, um, let's see, any council member updates, anything that you as a member have happening or new that you want to update the group with? Um, Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools, we will be hosting, um, and then we call it Enough is Enough, it's our community violence and awareness sort of campaign that activates the community, but on March 1st, we will be hosting a student summit, which is a team of student advisory committee members from each high school during the day, but that evening is a resource fair and panel that's open to the community. So anybody in the metro area, feel free to stop by Harmon High School. That open event to the public starts at 5 p.m. Um, and we will have community resources there. The panel will include our behavioral health coordinator, our superintendent, chief of police, and a few others. But feel free to stop by, meet and greet some of our amazing staff, the student leaders that we have really activating our community um, and then be a part of the panel. Good stuff, Tracy and KCK. Anybody else? Hi, Dahlia Schumann. I would just like to share that we are hosting our first uh, conference for education support professionals. The focus will be on social and emotional learning. Uh, for them to learn to take care of themselves as well as um, how to support students that they're working with. In addition, we're partnering with Educate Kansas. We're currently planning an educator retreat that will be taking place um, the week of July 17th and 21st. Details are still being worked out, but we're really hoping to provide this as an opportunity as well for educators across the state of Kansas to continue to take time to take care of themselves so they can be better prepared to meet the needs of our students. Thank you. Thanks, Adelia. That sounds really, really good. Good for everybody. Anybody else? Cherie, would you like to share? I would love to share. Um, no, I just uh, would um, give a, just really kind of want to stop and give a, a quick shout out um, to our district community leadership teams um, that we've been supporting um, through the state personnel professional development grant, uh, the uh, school mental health professional development coaching system that Carrie referenced earlier. Um, as we have been supporting them for the past several years to refine um, a systematic process for aligning efforts across systems and are now at the point where we are trying to transition those teams um, for sustainability so that they don't, you know, fully rely on us. There has been an incredible amount of success. Um, it's um, overall, we've been supporting, I've got to look here at my sheet, but it's um, five community mental health centers um, in across five different regions seven districts, an early childhood program, um, a K through 12 special education behavior day school, five special education cooperatives um, or interlocals, if you will, as well as foster care and juvenile services in the Great Bend region. And those teams have truly um, come together from, you know, earlier we had a parent representative you know, share her story. And, you know, she was expressing, you know, it's really important to have that support um, from leadership. Um, in this case, it's not just that it's, you know, a law or a mandate. These teams are actually passionate about serving the children and youth in their schools. And we have seen um, policy changed, um, special, you know, special education, um, you know, let's say in our, our Manhattan Ogden School District, for example, they uh, have documented utilizing 
a trauma responsive um, support planning process to support those children and youth who are served across systems, which really serves to address, you know, this, that need you guys have heard before, but, you know, district has one plan, community mental health center has another, foster care's got one, juvenile services has one, and, you know, the, the child or youth hasn't even been included in the development of that. And we are seeing person-centered planning um, we've had feedback from our community mental health centers that this is the that this is the closest that they have seen um, to wraparound taking place um, in uh, some of our most you know successful uh, areas that we support. We do have those MHIT liaisons, and they are they are doing one in particular. She's not. I don't think she's on today, but Sam Brown. Uh, she is actually on the school mental health advisory council. Um, and she could speak to the work that's been taking place, but she herself is an example of, um, you know, how strong, you know, that position can be when leadership helps to coordinate the um, utilization of that team member well. So just a shout out uh, to our teams who have done phenomenally well and um, continue to progress monitor and truly uh, sustain um, this process moving forward. It's pretty exciting. Thank you, Cherie. That is um, a good note <laughs> to hear. Um, a, a very good. We know the good work that is happening, and we want everyone, every parent, every grandparent, to experience that good work that's happening. So we'll keep at it. We'll keep at it. Thanks, Cherie. All right. So the last thing is we want to hear from you on future agenda topics. Is there something today that you thought, oh, I would like to hear this. I would like to hear that from this group. Today we had such good information. Is there something you were thinking of out there that would be, um, that we could try to access? The legislative updates were really, really helpful because we have a lot of information kind of flying around out there. So having Dr. Newswander with us to just really just walk through each one of those, that was really beneficial. I agree, John. We'll, we'll try to keep him hey. on every time. I'm on a Zoom. Can you give me about 10 minutes? I think July, if okay. we can have the update of what really happened. <laughs> <laughs> because you never know, just like last year, the House Bill 2567, it was like, let's make soup. All right, let's put this one in. Let's put that one in. Let's put that one in. And we came out with like 21 different things that came out of that one bill. You just don't know what's going to happen till the end of the session. And having a super majority makes it even more complex and complicated, depending upon what their priorities are and what they're capable of getting by veto by the governor. So anything right now is on the table, even things we haven't heard about. Yeah. And we'll give Craig more time, more time. And I think we need to update on any progress of the suicide subcommittee. Okay. I think that's something that we'll need to report okay. out. I agree, Bert. Anything else? I believe I probably uh, Scott Gordon shared a couple of items that will be acted on yet by the, especially with the restraint ESI. I think that we probably need to get a follow-up would be helpful once that is finalized. Good point, Adelia. Yeah, normally out of the regulation comes training. Yeah. It's true. I'd like to add one thing, if I may. Yes. Okay. Um, and I apologize to the group. I had a phone call coming in just as I was about to make a suggestion. So you probably heard me asking for 10 minutes. Real quick, one of the things I heard from the uh, student voice um, group, and I participate on that, the impact of school violence on mental health. And um, I don't know if you have, you have covered that issue, but it certainly has been on um, my mind and one of the things that I have pushed at the board table that uh, the, the student violence, especially uh, in our schools, I think hinges on um, um, 
the mental health issue. I'd love to hear, um, or maybe even have a robust discussion on how we can impact that because other students begin to worry about their safety in our buildings. And it just seems like a real issue. That's where we can get John Calvert involved. And perhaps he has some ideas for us since he re represents safe and secure schools, Betty. So that's a good idea. Very good idea. We haven't had anything like that, Betty. So I'm glad you um, spoke up. If we have, it's been a long time. Good I, Good thoughts. Any Anybody else? We're, we're taking them all down. Well, if anybody thinks of anything, because I realize our time is fleeting, please yeah. email Gail and yeah. she can wrap Betty and Jane in because Betty, I don't know if you're aware or not, but our uh, bylaws say that the state board member shall be the chair of this committee. Did they tell you that when you were voluntold? I mean, you volunteered to be here. Now you can delegate that to Jane as the vice chair, but uh, we'll keep you involved too. You and uh, Betty and Jane, anything we get in ideas because we will have a planning meeting before the July school mental health meeting with the executive leadership, which includes the two of you. And that's where we come up with the formal agenda for our July meeting. Sounds great. Great, oh, I'm sorry, Betty, go ahead. Go ahead, I, I just said sounds great. <laughs> he said she's very excited to know that. That's what she said. <laughs> she's fired up to lead this group. Um, and our next meeting, am I correct, is April 27th from 9 to 12. April 27th, 9 to 12. And you know... Notice that we've kept these meetings um, half days, whereas they used to be five, six hours. We are now, you know, focusing nine to noon. So I think that's a very good decision. All right. Anything from anybody before I adjourn? All right. Okay. I adjourn the meeting. Thank you so very, very much for all of your feedback. And thank you, Jane. You did a great job leading this group. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. Bye-bye. <laughs>